Measuring intangible services, the value of advice from, say, a good engineer, an architect, an accountant, a doctor, a lawyer, any service provider you can think of can be a daunting task. Yet it's often the measure that can make the difference between whether a business treats such advice or service as a nice-to-have discretionary cost or a must-have investment in the organization's future success. What factors determine which column it falls in? Today's guest has tremendous insight in measuring intangible services that can help both those who provide services show the value of what they do and those who need help justifying the benefits they receive. So stay tuned. This is Business Confidential Now with Hannah Hassel-Kelchner, helping you see business issues hiding in plain view that matter to your bottom line. Welcome to Business Confidential Now. I'm your host, Hannah Hassel-Kelchner, and I have a terrific guest for you today. She's Dr. Patty Phillips, a renowned leader in measurement and evaluation and the CEO of ROI Institute, who's helped organizations in more than 70 countries implement the trademarked ROI methodology. In a nutshell, she can show you how to measure and improve the success of any type of project, program, or initiative in whatever type of work you do. She's also the author of the book, Show the Value of What You Do. Whether it comes to performance reviews or landing new business, showing the value of what you do is important, especially if your work produces intangible benefits that are tough to quantify. So I am dying to learn more. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, Patty. Thank you, Hannah. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege to have you on the show today because showing the value of what you do when your business or career is in a service sector can be so difficult when the person you're talking to is looking for a straight line between the cost of your intangible service and a very measurable benefit to their bottom line. So how do you go about measuring intangible services? Where do you start? Right. So no, it is tough and it's a great question. And we are fortunate to have been working with this process for many, many years. So we've been in business for about 25 years and had the opportunity to look at all types of different programs and projects and different types of businesses. And it really starts with why, you know, why are you doing what you're doing in the first place and getting clarity around that why. So when we talk about intangible, typically intangible outputs or intangible outcomes are those measures that we're not converting to money necessarily. They tend to be more subjective in nature than objective, whereas the more tangible we can count those. And so to really look at those, we just have to get clear on, you know, why are we doing it? So example in service sector, I don't know, let's think of a good example. You know, maybe you're just trying to tease your customers or deliver better customer value. Well, sometimes, you know, that's, that's hard to measure because what is it? How do you know you need to do that? What is happening or not happening that needs to change that will give or offer up that greater customer value? And then what do you mean by customer value in the first place? So do you have complaints? Are you trying to increase the number of customers? Is it market share you're looking for? So it's really about defining what you mean. Okay. You mentioned before that there's subjectivity in this. How do you remove subjectivity from the process when measuring intangible services? Mm -hmm. Well, there's subjectivity in everything, right? So when we talk about math, one plus one is two, unless you want to be wrong. But then the question is, from where do the one and the one come? So there's always subjectivity in everything that we do. Again, it's about the clarification. We can remove subjectivity by considering the source, even though there's subjectivity there, or we can remove subjectivity by, again, being more specific in the questions that we're asking, be more specific in the measures that we're taking. We can be remove subjectivity by having a process being able to explain what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it that way. So, for example, we have a process. I think it was Debbie Edward Simming who said, if you can't explain what you do as a process, you don't know what you're doing. So it's all about process, you know, exactly what are you going to do. And then that process also helps you explain exactly what you did once it's done so that it can be replicated in the future. So we have a process. We start with why are we doing it? We get clarity around the needs. If it's Again, focused on the customer, focused on the employee, whatever it is that we're trying to solve, the opportunity or the problem we're trying to solve, get clarity around there. And then we sort out, well, what is happening or not happening that needs to change? And if we change it, it will actually help us solve that problem or leverage that opportunity. 
And then we set it up with very clear objectives, setting up goals or objectives or your OKRs so that you can design solutions and programs and processes around the outcomes you're trying to achieve. And then we just go out and collect a little data. We can use technology to help with us when we're collecting data today. So technologies enable that a little bit. And then we just do a little bit of analysis, ask some questions, sort out cause and effect, so to speak. Ask yourself, ask your sources of data, ask people what caused the change, what are the factors that influenced it. But again, it gets really to the process. What are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing that way? And then setting up standards around the process. You know, your decision-making rules. So that really helps with that, that subjectivity. Again, it's all somewhat subjective. Any kind of measurement is, unless you're doing the math, but it's setting up process, using standards to support the process, being able to replicate what you're doing over and over so that you can see some reliability in the answers that you're getting. So I'm not sure that that's answering it. It's a great question. No, and I think we're that's... Always- about it. I think that's good. I think it certainly helps from the perspective of the person who is trying to solve the specific problem. Let me flip that on you for a second. And if you're the service provider, not the one who's trying to decide and do something internally, because it sometimes it seems that when it comes to intangible services, because people don't understand them, it's easy for them to focus on price. Like (laughs) the reverse is going to buy a bottle of wine when you know nothing about wine because you're going to a dinner party and you want to bring a bottle. So what do people use? They use price. Well, the more expensive bottle is probably going to be better, right? It's not always the case. But when it comes to businesses, sometimes they think these services are fungible. And so they go for the lowest cost price. And the cheapest is not always the least expensive in the long run, but that's a difficult lesson for people to learn sometimes. Right. So if you have a service that somebody is perceiving to be fungible, what's a good way to start showing the value of what you do? When we look at value of what we do, we look at it in terms of a chain of impact. So it is, you know, ultimately we get to an ROI, cost-benefit comparison, so you know, bottom line. But we look at things in terms of this chain of impact. So if you're offering a service, and you want people to view it as valuable to them beyond the price tag. First, we've got to position it so that it's compelling. So is it compelling? Are we positioning it so they're really buying into this? They see us as a service that will deliver for them. What is it people need to know about your service? What do you want people to do? And what should you do to ensure that people know what it is they need to know so they're compelled to come with you? And if you do those things, or if they do their, what you want them to do, what are those expected outcomes? So again, chain of impact. We have five levels of outcome. Everything begins with the investment that you make in whatever the project or the process or the business is. We look at reaction again, compelling messaging. Do people view this process or this business as relevant to their needs, whatever those needs are? Are we providing new information, new insights that will influence them in some way? And with that information, is it something that's actionable? Will they actually do something with it? What will they do with it? And then what are the consequences of it? And then, of course, we get to ROI. So it gets back to this chain of impact that occurs. And then also recognizing that, yes, people often go to the bottom line. We see it a lot. We've made those decisions, too. And, you know, you get what you pay for. Sometimes you don't get what you pay for. It depends. We can pay too little, pay too much. But what else is there? So what are those intangible benefits, those additional benefits besides the money? Is it going to make it easier for you? Is it going to offer some kind of service or support post-purchase? What are all the other things that they're going to give you? What happens if you make a purchase or you sell to someone and it doesn't work for them? Is there some kind of their refund or is there service? Is there value add? So we try to position it a service or work when we're working with clients, try to put, help them position their service or their product in such a way that people are clear on why they're going there beyond the price, what has to happen for them to get the greatest value, and then ensure they have the knowledge and information insight they need to get that value. So again, it gets back to this chain of impact. 
And it sounds hard. It sounds like a lot. And your listeners may be saying, oh, my gosh, it's too hard. It really isn't. It's just logical. We do it all the time. You well, know, you go and you, you know, you go shopping and you do it all the time. You, you look and say, oh, yeah, I kind of like that. Now, what's the price? I've just learned something new. Then you act or you don't act. And well, you're so, right. The, it can sound very abstract. So mm-hmm. do you have a concrete example that you could give us? Well, I do. I actually am working on a project now with an organization. So we work with for-profit, not-for-profit, non-governmental organizations. We work with leadership development a lot. So programs, people come to us and they're either selling leadership development to other people or they've purchased leadership development. Because as we've talked, you and I were talking earlier about the importance of leadership. And, you know, that's pretty abstract, too, sometimes. So in working with an organization who's trying to develop their leaders, we say, well, why are you? Well, we want to change our culture. To what? You know, let's get clear on it. What is happening or not happening that's telling you you need to change your culture? What are the business measures or the impact measures you're trying to change? What would happen if you didn't change your culture? So we really start that conversation around why are you doing this? What is the so what if you're trying to do? So again, a leadership development, they call us in, they ask us to, to evaluate the leadership development. And we start with, why are you doing it? Well, we want leaders. Well, let's talk more why. Are you looking for market share? Are you looking for customer satisfaction? Are you looking for greater engagement from your employees? Are you trying to reduce turnover? What are you trying to do here? Now, what are the behaviors that you're seeing? What are the processes that need to change? So leadership development is a pretty good example, and it's pretty soft. We're working with a nonprofit now where they're looking at the program is intended to help get people out of impoverished environments, get them employed, get them to work, get them driver's license. That's not so intangible as we talk about, but still very soft compared to some of the other projects that we do. And so in working with them, it's like, okay, what is it that they need to know? What do they need to learn? What do they need to do with what they know. And if they do that, what's that outcome going to be for them? So they get driver's license, they get their commercial driver's license, they get a job, they get a better job. Now they can start getting themselves out of a situation because they have some independence. So that's the type of project that we might work with. We may work with higher ed. We do a lot of work in higher ed to help them evaluate the programs and projects that they're putting into place. So just any number of programs or projects that we can work with. Again, it gets back to the logic behind that chain of impact. What is it that you want people to think about your product or your service or your business? What do they need to know to do what you want them to do? And if they do those things, how is that going to help you or them improve output quality cost or time or innovation or customer satisfaction or employee satisfaction or work habits, how it's going to help the community. So again, that chain of impact. In the book that we wrote, there's a lot of stories. One of the stories is a story that about a case study we did with uh, the uh, chaplains, with a group of chaplains. So around 2016, we were invited to work with this group, 25 chaplains. And it was so interesting to us because we never even thought about the need for chaplains to demonstrate the value of what they do. Because they're chaplains, you know, how could you, you know, not trust a chaplain? You figure they're doing it, right? But that's not always true because they too are funded. They're funded by organizations, they're funded by individuals, they're funded by nonprofits, they work in healthcare, they work in the military. And so, in working with the chaplains, we really looked at it as that executive coach, that counselor. Like, okay, what is it that you do? What is it that people need to know given what you do? So there's a great story in the book, actually the open story of the new book, that talks about this one chaplain that working in the healthcare organization. And he came to us and he said, this is happening. He's working in a healthcare organization. And the question was, how much value are you really bringing to this organization? So he actually did his own little experiment. And then he worked in the ICU and he did a test, chaplain in the ICU versus chaplain outside the ICU. Now the test, the control group, wasn't ideal. It was a more of a comparison group. But he did do this little test to see how it impacted what was going on in that ICU, how it impacted the patient, how it impacted the physician. And so the outcome of that little experiment was really, really interesting. 
And then he tried to tie it. His outcome, he tried to tie it to length of stay and some other measures. So it's an example of how we can show the value of what we do, even if we're a chaplain. And the chaplains, you don't get much softer than that. So we see that. We see people wanting to demonstrate the value of what they do. Maybe it's a food bank they've opened up. We've got good colleagues that have done that to show that value because there's value in what we do in everything. I look at, you know, your guests on your podcast, every one of your guests on the podcast contribute value in some way. It's just how do you define it? Is it making people feel better? Is it giving people knowledge? Is it inspiring them to do something different, to do something they're not doing or do something they once did, but you compel them to do it again. You know, they're changing their behavior, changing the processes. And then what are the outcomes of that? So again, just thinking chain of impact. Why are we doing what we're doing? How can we do it differently? And if we do that, what's the impact going to be? Or if we don't do it, what's the risk associated with it? We talk about risk avoidance. In your previous career, you work in in law, a lot of that is about risk. There's no cost, there's no productivity, but we're trying to avoid a cost. We're trying to avoid something from happening. Well, what's the value of that? And it's hard sometimes because it's like, well, it's never happened, but it could happen. So what's the value of doing that? And it could be huge. And then you have to think about, well, what is the real risk or what are the real odds that that is going to happen. So it's classic cost-benefit analysis. Again, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it that way? What is the opportunity for the organization to make money, save money, avoid costs, or do greater good while it's making money, saving money, and avoiding costs? And then what needs to change to help them get there? And then what do people need to know to create the change to help them make money, save money, avoid costs, and do greater good? And how best can you roll it out? so that people know what they need to know to do what you want them to do so they can achieve the outcome that they hope. hope well, I could have put a big bow on that, Patty. <laughs> 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 a very logical process makes a lot of sense. I like the way you've laid it out and particularly appreciate the examples that you gave. I think sometimes business owners, especially small and medium-sized business owners, are so busy doing what they do that they just have a very cursory analysis. They don't go as deep as what you've described, but yet there's a lot of value in going deep. So I'm just wondering in your experience when measuring intangible services or showing the value of what you do, what have you found trips people up in the sequence of the process that you've described where they maybe just stop halfway through or a partial way through or hit one particular thing, oh, this is too hard. We're just going to keep on plodding along the way we are, or maybe only come up with a half-baked solution. Is there a spot like that, a sticking point that's worse than another? Yeah, well, I mean, there's always sticking points. I think shiny object gets us derailed sometimes. Yeah, Yeah, there's a crisis that comes into play, and we sometimes get derailed, and sometimes people do think. Sometimes people overthink, and that's one of the, especially with small businesses, you know, small businesses, we're in a hurry, right? We get things done. And it's not like the large corporations where, you know, there are a lot of resources to help. You've got to get things done. And so I think sometimes people overthink the process because it's not hard. It's, you know, there's work to be done, but it's not hard. And the good thing about small businesses and medium-sized businesses is that owners are so close to the measures that matter most, right? They know that bottom line, but more than that, they know, what they're trying to accomplish in terms of mission. They know their employees. They know what needs to change. So I think sometimes people get you know, sidetracked for sure and get off track. And then two, I think sometimes it's just overthinking it. It does not have to be hard. It's just questions that we ask. And then it gets to, okay, how do we ask those questions? To whom do we target those questions? And how absolutely accurate do we need to be? And I think that's something people struggle with, depending on what the project is. You know, we have to think about what's the risk of getting it wrong. Because we all know entrepreneurs and small business owners, medium sized business, large corporate leaders all know there's risk of getting things wrong, right? But how much is that risk? What is that true risk? Because if the risk is small, to get if you get the wrong answer and nobody's really going to get hurt, you still want to be clear on it. You still want to do a good job. 
but maybe it is just let's go ask some people. Let's just go have some conversations to understand what is going on. On the other hand, if there's a higher risk of getting it wrong, associated with getting it wrong, somebody's going to get hurt, somebody's going to lose a job, that's when you really have to go deep with it. So I think sometimes we overthink the whole accountability thing. And that's where we are today is a culture of accountability. You know, everyone's working at home. Well, how are your employees going to demonstrate the value that they bring? Because you've got managers who are trying to go through this process of managing from a distance. And that nut has not been cracked. I mean, we've all been working at home for a long time, but in the corporate setting, that nut is still you know, not been cracked. It's how do we best manage and lead from afar when in the past, management and leadership was happening in front of you. And so it's in part, managers and leaders have to instill this culture of accountability while instilling a culture of support and engagement and experience. But it's also incumbent upon the employees to say, how can I best demonstrate the value of what I'm doing so that when we have those performance conversations, we can clearly see that, yeah, I am contributing. And so it's just using the same process. It's like, you know, what is it that we're looking for? What are those performance goals? What exactly do I need to do to achieve those goals? And what is it I need to know to do what I need to do to achieve those goals? And then you just tell your story. So I think, again, to your question, shiny objects get us off route. I think overthinking things sometimes get us derailed. And I think to process. You know, we're all scattered doing so many things, but you just can't get away from the value of a good process. Process and step standards when you're around your assumptions can help us. So it'll save us time. And then also leveraging some of the technology that we have. I mean, we've got lots of tools on our computers that can help us. We just often don't use them or we jump over to the next next best one. So. The next shiny object, right? The next shiny object, yeah. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Patty. This has really been amazing insight into a topic that often defies quantification. So thanks for helping us gain a better understanding of how value can be demonstrated and can be appreciated with the process that you've outlined. So if you're listening and you'd like more information about Dr. Patty Phillips's work and how to measure success, the ROI Institute where she works or her book, Show the value of what you do. Those links can be found in the show notes at businessconfidentialradio.com. And if you know someone who could benefit from measuring intangible services, whether to demonstrate the value of what they do or the value of what they receive, please tell them about this podcast episode. Share the link, leave a positive review so others can learn too. And you could do that on your podcast app or at lovethepodcast.com forward slash businessconfidential. Thank you for listening to Business Confidential Now with Hannah Hassel-Kelschner. Have a great day and an even better tomorrow.